Uh, creed, creed. What comes to your mind when you hear the word creed? Maybe this guy right here, Creed Bratton from The Office. He's my, probably my favorite character. I, mean, I just love this guy. Like Jim and Pam in The Office, blah. Creed, creed is where it's at. Uh, or maybe, maybe uh, this band comes to mind. Any, anybody listen to Creed at all? When I was in high school, I loved this band. With arms wide open. I wanted to do a special, but they wouldn't let me. Uh, or maybe it's uh, this movie right here, Michael B. Jordan, Creed. Oh, this is Creed Two, I guess. The older Creed. I think that's 80s. Uh, I know some people say, ah, the original Creed is, is better. But Creed. What's up with the, with the name Creed? Like TV characters share the name, bands, uh, boxers apparently, and, and movies. What does it actually mean, though? Well, creed comes from the Latin credo, and it just means, I believe. So in this series, Creed, what we're going to be doing is something that Christians really need to do right now in this climate and in this culture. Christians, we need to nail down our beliefs, what really matters, what unites us. Because right now, there are so many things to disagree about. Social justice. COVID, politics, worship styles, traditions, mandates. I mean, so many things to disagree about, and we've been doing our fair share of that disagreeing, often breaking the heart of God in the process. But what really brings us together? What unites us? It's our creed. Our creed does that. In a world that is becoming more and more shallow, where the term Christian is used very loosely, where lines are being blurred everywhere. It's our job as a church community to sit down and clarify, remind ourselves, teach our kids the essentials, our creed, our credo. So for the next several weeks, we're going to be getting a little bit more traditional as a church, which is very unlike the bridge, but we're going to be doing something uh, that the church uh, that has held on to for the last, man, several, several hundred years, special to us because it is our essentials. It is massive theology packed into a creed. It's the, it's the fat guy in a little theological coat, if you will. Come on, office reference, Tommy Boy reference, I me, mean, come on, I'm, I'm giving you gold stuff here. But for the next several weeks, or seven weeks, we're going to be talking about theology, creed, the Apostles' Creed, to be exact. It's 303 AD, Rome. Diocletian rules from Palatine Hill. He steps out onto his patio, surveying his world-class city on this brisk, clouded morning. The chilly wind cuts over the railings, send a chill up, up his spine. It snaps him awake. See, down the street, various construction crews are yelling to each other as they try to keep up with the demand that Rome has made on them to make Rome bigger and better, better than his predecessor. Squadrons of soldiers with their feathered helmets stand in strategic spots all around Palatine Hill, guarding from, the, from insurrection, possible insurrection, which is much more possible today. See, today an edict went out from Rome, a major one, an edict that rescinds the rights of Christians. For a while, Christians have been exempt from worshiping the state-approved gods. They, they were seen as a sect of Judaism, therefore exempt from worshiping the state-approved gods, but no longer. They are now to bow to whatever Rome has approved. And littered throughout the city are Christians, some ethnic Jews, some Greek, some Roman, some African, all followers of Jesus. And it's today's edict that will result in the boycotting of their businesses. See, it's textbook tyranny. First, you take away their ability to make money through restrictions and social shaming. If they don't break, then comes prison, then comes beatings. Last resort, you cleanse them by death. And Christians are quickly running out of resources. Many in the church have been beat. Some have been arrested. A few have been taken to the Colosseum and eaten by lions as sport. See, for months, really for years, it was a consistent form of entertainment. Go watch the Christians being slaughtered in the stadium. Families together being slaughtered in the Colosseum. This is where the creed comes in. Scripture has been confiscated from these people. And it's these people that began to cling to something they called the Roman Creed. Some claim the apostles wrote it before they left Jerusalem to preach. Not quite sure, but it's this creed, the Roman creed, eventually named the Apostles' Creed, that became the rallying cry for believers. It's short to memorize. It's the basics of their faith. It united Jew and Gentile. It united black and white. It united Roman sympathizer and zealot. This is what they held on to with their dying breath. And so maybe coming into this series, it feels a little traditional to you. Maybe you'd rather study a book of the Bible. I'm with you on that. 
But it's this creed that gives us a rich, rich anchor to a rather sweet past. You think about it, as we look and say these words, we are linking up with 1,900 years worth of Jesus followers, many persecuted, many martyred. They gathered around this theology. Many sang these words with shaky, nervous voices as they're being arrested, watching their businesses burn. Some sang these words with their last dying breath. And now here we are, and it's our turn at the wheel. They had the baton, and now we got it. We should know this. We should champion this. We should teach this to our children. On the docket today is, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Father, that is who we are talking to right now. You, almighty creator of heaven and earth. Father, we ask that you speak to us. You will speak to us. I pray that we listen. May your Holy Spirit open our hearts, engage our minds. And God, we, we want to connect with you during this time. You want to connect with us. May that happen tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Nehemiah 9, chapter 9, verse 6 is where we're going to be at. Nehemiah 9, verse 6. This is a, uh, as you'll see if you're opening your Bibles, really, I hope you have your Bibles. We have Bibles in the chairs. Um, otherwise, we also have the Bridge app, and you can grab the Bridge app, and we've got the Bible, as well as our notes on there as well, which is nice to have in one spot. But Nehemiah 9, 6, we're going to be looking closely at these words. These words are great to memorize, uh, at least worth underlining if you underline in your Bibles. But Nehemiah 9, verse 6, we'll walk through this slowly. It says, you are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts. You know, if we go back to Genesis 1, Yahweh, God, called the stars out by name. He spoke them into existence as if it were nothing. Think about it this way. The sun. The sun is 93 million miles away from us, and yet it can scorch us. Last February, Nicole and I, we went to uh, South Florida to, to get away. Uh, we stayed at a friend's place, and it was our, our delayed 10-year anniversary trip. And uh, the first day that we got to Florida, uh, she says to me, she says, wear sunscreen, babe. Don't ruin the trip by getting burned and being miserable the rest of the time. So can you just put on sunscreen? But I told her, I said, I'm not running away from, you know, Chicago February to, to like run away from the sun. So I pulled my hair back and I fell asleep on the beach. The next day, pieces of my forehead were flying off as I was driving, like chunks of skin. It was, it was, it was junior jerky. 93 93 million miles away, destroyed my face. Like, that's power. And Yahweh just spoke that orange ball into an existence. And comparatively, it's, it's not even that big of a star. There's a, a star uh, called uh, Beetlejuice, which uh, other, than, um, other than being a show that my parents wouldn't let me watch growing up, Beetlejuice is a star that is 700 times bigger than our sun. So, so hold the phone. Think about this. Our Earth, think about this this way. Our Earth, it takes a day of flight to go from one side to the other. I mean, our Earth, pretty big. One million of our Earths could fit into the sun. Beetlejuice is 700 times larger than our sun. Some astronomers claim that there are stars so big we could fit our entire solar system inside of them. And Isaiah writes, Yahweh measures the span of the universe with his fingers. Whose might measures that of God? Who do you put in his weight class to measure him with anyone? It's just a cosmic joke. And Yahweh knows it. In the book of Job, God says this. He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Who laid its cornerstones? Have you ever given the orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? Can you bind the chains of blades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Can you bring forth constellations in their season? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Nehemiah writes, you are the Lord, you alone you have made the heaven, the heavens of the heavens, with all their hosts. He's the maker of heavens, spoken into existence. How soon do we forget that? How big we feel? And sometimes we need this reminder. We are a speck living on a piece of dust 
and the vast universe in the hands of God. How soon we forget. The other night, I, I couldn't sleep. And my mind was, was racing, and um, I got a buddy who had, goes through the same thing, a childhood friend of mine. And he lives in New York, and he couldn't sleep that night as well. And so we were just texting back and forth, and he sent me this cartoon, which is what I needed in that moment. I love this cartoon. It's become my favorite. The guy getting his picture taken, he says, make sure you see how insignificant I am. It's so good, isn't it? I've talked to people who have said to me, they said, I hate staring at the stars because staring at the stars makes me feel insignificant. See, that's why I love it. When I go up to our camp, I sleep so well. I was up there this, this last week and uh, actually alone for a night. I was just staring at the stars. I could stare at the stars for, for hours, just reminding myself I am so, so small. My problems, they are nothing for Yahweh. Our minds down here, they race with anxiety, worries, problem, drama, disagreements, division. But as the band Switchfoot puts it so perfectly, but when I look at the stars, I see someone else. COVID, political messes, family drama, society deterioration, it's nothing for Yahweh. I am so glad I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Nehemiah continues with that thought, earth, the earth, and all that is on it. One of my family's favorite pastimes is uh, we, we go to the zoo, and uh, we're there, no exaggeration, we're there weekly. Nicole will take my girls there a couple times, a couple times a week. It's like our second home. Like, we know the employees by name. Um, we know a lot of the animals now by name. And we just, we just love walking around, and we, we try to do it intentionally, just to enjoy Yahweh's creativity. His work. I love walking through the zoo and seeing this guy, Shoe Bill Stork. This guy's a giant standing five feet tall, eight foot wingspan, can take flight. Or the prairie dogs and their complex tunnel systems. Love walking through the bat house with their built in radar. The humongous polar bear with a paw bigger than my face. Or the wildebeest. Which you know, God has a sense of humor when you look at the wildebeest. It's like God had all these leftover animal parts at the end. He's like, well, let's just put together the wildebeest. But designed, constructed, and sustained by God. I mean, I feel bad for people who don't believe this creed, not just because of where they're headed in eternity, but they can't appreciate the design of life as much without appreciating the designer and the sustainer. Nat Geo would have nothing to show off if it weren't for God. It was God who said, can you lead the bear to his cubs? Who gives the ibis wisdom or gives the rooster understanding? Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in the weight in the thicket? Who provides the food for the raven? He is designer, creator, sustainer, maker. I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth. Nehemiah continues. He says, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. When I was in high school, my, my dad and I, we, um, we got our, our scuba diving license. It was something that my dad and I could do together because we're very, very different. Uh, he, you know, he's a wrestler. I played basketball. Like, diving was something that we both found really interesting and fun, and we could do that together. The sea is just something else. It has taken my breath away like, underwater multiple times. Mature blue whales. This is not me diving, by the way. I wish it was. These guys can grow to the size of three school buses. Uh, the mimic octopus can imitate flounder, jellyfish, stingrays, sea snakes, or rocks. How these guys change colors and shapes. It's unbelievable. Or the Mariana Trench is seven miles deep. It was recently explored by a uh, special submarine that had almost four inch thick titanium walls just to stand, withstand the incredible pressure in that pure darkness. And yet, there is life that survives down there. Or have you ever, have you ever stood in the waves of the sea? Just the, the, the sheer power. I took my youngest to the ocean to teach her how to boogie board. And, and the waves, which weren't that big, I mean, they're just like Florida waves, they were tossing her around like a rag. Now, she loved it the whole time, but they were just tossing her around like a rag doll. To be candid with you, they were tossing me around like a rag doll. Just four foot waves. Surfers consider a good wave to be 20 feet. 
The sea holds so much power, so much life. And it was he who said, who shut the sea behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb. I said, this far you will come and no further. Here is where your proud waves halt. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked the recesses of the deep? See, Christians aren't anti-science. It's anything, anything but. Some of the most prolific biologists, marine biologists, astronomers, scientists, leaders in their fields pioneered their work because they just wanted to investigate their maker more to see what God has done. Creation points to creator. Life leaves clues of a designer. I love what St. Augustine wrote. He wrote, men go abroad to wonder at the heights of the mountains, at the huge waves of the sea, at the long courses of the rivers, the vast compass of the ocean, the circular motions of the stars. And they pass by themselves without wondering, without wondering who thought of this, who made this, who's holding it together, who gets the credit. I believe it's God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Nehemiah continues still in verse 6. He says, and you preserve all of them, and the hosts of heavens, heaven worship you. Preserve. He doesn't just create and walk away like a deadbeat. He creates, he preserves, he's holding it together. This is in your notes. Number one, God is maker. God is maker. There's an amazing documentary series called the, it's Genesis History. Nicole and I are actually ordering it for our kids. But in the series, the series dives into nature while interviewing leading marine biologists, scientists, and astronomers about the idea of creation and intelligent design, which has been thrown to the wayside over the years. I mean, you watch on TV now a lot of like the, the nature documentaries. It's, 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 you take it as like evolution as fact. But leading scientists, many of them, uh, who are not Christian, by the way, too, are saying it's a huge mistake to assume there isn't a designer and a maker and a sustainer for all of this. They put it this way. You ever go to like an aquarium? My, my family, I love going to the, the Shed Aquarium uh, in the city. Beautiful exhibits, colorful tanks, you know, big fish, coral. Uh, they bring so much to these like aquariums. And so much manpower is devoted to keeping these tanks alive. Like teams of staff that work around the clock to take care of these relatively small tanks. Compare that to the, compare that to the massive ocean filled with teams of life. How can that just happen? I don't have enough faith to believe that it's by chance this just created itself and sustains itself. Who's sustaining it? Who's checking the oxygen levels? Who's checking the salinity? Who's managing the ecosystem? Who's routing the currents? It's not chaos. It's designed, it's organized, it's managed. There's a maker. Or when it comes to uh, DNA. DNA, right, right now, every cell in our bodies is packed with DNA. I read one scientist um, this, this week. I didn't really understand. He said that every cell in our body has three feet of DNA in it. Like, how does that work? Like, what font size are we talking about here? Because I, I don't understand, necessarily understand what that means. Maybe, though maybe you do because you, you do well in biology. I never did well in biology. But biologists are now uh, beginning to crack the code of DNA. It's pretty fascinating. I won't get deep into it because, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm no expert. I only passed biology because I took it with uh, my then girlfriend, <clears throat> now my wife, and she's the only reason I passed biology. But this is very, this is very interesting. I've got to tell you about this. The foundation of DNA is made of, of four uh, units called nucleotides. And these are the foundational units. These nucleotides combine to make 20 different amino acids. And these 20 different amino acids then produce more than 100,000 different proteins. All of this makes a code that makes up you. This determines your eye color, your hair texture, your size. Many biologists claim that our DNA code has all the hallmarks of an actual language, extremely complex. It's why they're actually beginning to break it because they're finding that there's, there's patterns like a language. It's very organized. And it's this that is making biologists not want to throw out intelligent design to the wayside. Because it's not just as simple to say, well, um, you know, life, we rose from just matter. No, no, no. Matter has to have DNA. And for matter to have DNA, there has to be a language. In order for there to be a language, there has to be an organization. If there has to be an organization, there has to be an organizer, there has to be a writer. And it's this DNA conversation, this DNA encoding, that is making guys like uh, Richard Dawkins, who wrote The God Delusion, 
very staunch atheist, it's making him second guess his stance against intelligent design because this is just too complex. It's way too organized. There has to be a source. The second law of thermodynamics states that energy tends toward equilibrium. Hot things will cool. Moving things will slow. Spinning things will stop unless there is a sustainer. Almighty maker. He creates within the womb. And there, and some some of you moms have felt this in your own belly, but in the womb, miracles happen constantly. Around 20 weeks, a million a million optic nerve endings left the optic nerve center of your brain while a million nerve endings left your eye. And they had to meet and match and find their exact partner. A million looking for a million. And the moment they met, they fused, they connected, and it gave you instant sight. Your eye is the most technologically advanced thing on the planet. Forget your iPhone, forget the sensors, forget computers. It's your eye. Who came up with it? I believe God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth. But it's better than that. We don't just have a a maker. The one who mapped orbits, spoke stars, and coded DNA. He wants to be more than just a maker. He wants to be, number two, father. His power is only matched by his love. You Think about it. Why? Why would the God who formed the depths of the sea, who spun planets, why would God care at all to be the father of an insignificant sinner on a broken speck called earth? when we have constantly overlooked him, when we walked away from him, these tiny, little, rebellious, hard-to-deal-with, petty people, God wants to be their dad. Yeah, how did Jesus teach us to pray? Almighty, big builder, holiest, genius. No, 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 no. Jesus said you don't have to get a dictionary of systematic theology to address him. Just call him Abba. Call him Dad, because that's what he wants. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You are holy, you are king of the universe, but you're also my dad. God is Father. For some of us, that is an awesome, fun thought to grasp. It blows our mind. We love it because some of us have awesome dads. Others of us look at this, many in here look at this, and it's hard because our dad wasn't awesome. He wasn't great. He left or he abused or used you, or he was difficult to please. That's the tricky part about this whole idea is we tend to think about God in light of our own dads. Not always, but it's just a psychological tendency. If your dad was distant, God seems to be more distant to you. If if your dad was harsh, God seems to be just more cruel to you. If your dad was cowardly, God is more permissive and and not as just. He just kind of winks at, at sin. I talk with people all the time, messed up view of God because they see him in light of their jacked up dad. That's why it's on my heart for my girls. I pray, God, may I represent you well. May they have an easier time seeing you for who you are because of their earthly dad, me. So, see, this is like a fun thought, a fun point for some of us. We had great representations of a father. Difficult for others who had poor representations. But for those of us who had poor representations, in God, you have the father you never had but always wanted. Loving, merciful, present father. But again, it's even better than that. He's an adoptive father. He chose you. He wants to be your father. It's not like he got stuck with you. He chose you, adoptive dad. And not based on what you've done or who you are. That's all filthy rags. It doesn't matter. He chose you based on what his son Jesus Christ did. It's like like if if you're good with my kids, you're probably going to be good with me. Best way to get in good with me, be good to my kids. Now, if you're not good to my kids, like you're hard on them, okay, now we got a problem. Like, I just, I don't want to be around you. You ain't coming to my house if I can help it. But if you're good to my kids, like, we're, we're, we're good. That's how God is with, with us. We walk into heaven, and God's like, what are, you, what are you doing here? I'm with Jesus. And the Father's like, well, get in here. You hungry? Welcome home. God is Father. Father and Maker. It seems like these two titles, they just shouldn't go together. Maker, Maker. Maker and father, maker. I mean, nobody is like him. 
Nobody's in his class. He can do what he wants. He checks with nobody. He is all power, almighty with a snap of his finger. This is all gone like it never had been. And with all of that might, he takes on skin, he veils his glory, he dies on a cross to pay for the sin of a bunch of insignificant, hard to deal with humans living on a speck in the universe, to be our father. Somehow, these two titles, they come together beautifully in Yahweh. The truth is, you you can't do anything about God being your creator, he just is. But you don't have to have him as your father. That's up to you. That's a relationship. A relationship that's more than a belief in fact. Jesus said even the demons believe in God. That's not, that's not what gives you salvation. Believe in God. Even the demons believe. They got that going for them. It's the relationship. It's the seeking. It's the following after. It's the lordship. It's the walking with God. It's the relationship. A relationship that he craves to have with you. It doesn't add up. But that's what he wants with you. Almighty maker, loving father. I had a lot of dad fails this summer. I took my, uh, my, my youngest fishing this summer. And uh, while I was fishing, she was on the boat talking because she never stops talking. And I'm fishing. She's talking until I hear a splash. And I didn't put a life jacket on her, by the way. She fell off the boat without a life jacket on. My fault. I dove on the boat, bloodied up my knees, grabbed her arm. She's coughing. Dad fail. A couple days later, I was driving a, a golf cart up at camp. It was, it was storming, and I promised the girls, I had a meeting, so I promised the girls, hey, I will get you ice cream at the canteen if you just hang out at this meeting with me. On our way to the meeting, it's, it's downpouring, you know, dark getting soaked as, as we were driving. And, and Madison yells to me. She says, hey, Dad, don't go down that hill with the golf cart. We'll crash. Problem is, this is a shortcut. And I don't crash stuff. Like, I'll show her how good I am at this kind of stuff. So I yanked the steering wheel, went down the hill, started spinning. The tires wouldn't catch, grip the wet grass. We're spinning around, hit a tree. Madison goes flying out of the cart. I get out. I find her laying in a puddle, holding her head, screaming. And she was okay. Dad fail. Big dad fail. Both those times scared me good. Like when I I pulled Reese out of the water, I held her tighter than I ever had, just sitting on the edge of that boat. When I found Madison laying in the puddle in the pouring rain, I scooped her up and I sat with her in that mud puddle, pouring rain for quite a while. Partly because I felt bad, like both times my fault, but partly because I could have lost them. I don't want to lose them. They're mine. I'd I'd rather drown. I'd rather split my head open a thousand times over. You parents know what it's like. Every time, you you know, I I go to a play or a game or a recital, I'm looking for mine in the crowd. The ones that look like their mama. The messy, uncoordinated, often annoying little children. Because they're mine. And they bring me a smile and they stir my love. I am their dad and I'm proud of it. And I'm an idiot dad. How much more does the perfect father feel about you? Created in his image, pinnacle of creation. Oh, he enjoys the handiwork of the mega stars. He walks the recesses of the deep. He directs the migration, but he's looking for you. Because it's you he wants. It's you who stirs his love. Messy, often annoying, hard to deal with, you and me us. He's almighty maker, but his favorite title is father. Is he yours? See, that's our so what. This is where we start the creed. Is he your father? Do you have that relationship? The father that sacrificed everything for it. He's walking the recesses of the deep, mapping orbits, but he's looking for you. He wants you. I believe in God, the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And Father, we thank you for that truth that you are a dad. We thank you for how awesome you are, for how 
great you are, for how mighty you are. God, as a church, we corporately confess that so often we forget that. So often we lose sight of just how great and mighty you are. So Father, may you remind us of that through the power of your Holy Spirit. Like that cartoon showed, God, may we, as your people, may we want to feel that insignificance in a way of looking at your handiwork, of looking at your stars. It is not about how big we are, but it's who we are, whose we are. We are significant because we are children of yours. We thank you for that wonderful truth. God, I pray for anybody in this room who's not yet taken that free gift of salvation, taking you as father. I pray they do that tonight. What an amazing thing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.